Welcome to Red Beard Radio. I'm Brian Keith, and there is a secret that I wasn't told when I was growing up. Well, I was sort of told it, but not seriously. And that secret is that what you wear actually defines your reality at a really deep level. There wasn't a class in college on this. There wasn't a class in high school. And I wasn't around guys who really dressed any way other than to get to work that my dad built houses and he was often dressed to build houses, which was appropriate for that. But when I got into the rest of the world, I wasn't really prepared to think about really, well, what is looking good like? What is style beyond ready to get dirty and ready to be protected against the elements as you're climbing mountains or building houses? We have on the podcast today a style expert to help us walk through some of those things that I didn't hear growing up and to help you dress more correctly for where you want to get to in the world. Tanner, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Brian. I'm excited to talk, man. What really attracted me when I started following you on Twitter, and how do you spell your last name again? Guzzy, G-U-Z-Y. G-U-Z-Y. Yep. Great. So what attracted me to following you on Twitter was you just have this clarity around, hey, how you dress is affecting what you get out of life. No, really, I mean it, so start paying attention. Yeah. I would love to hear about some of the transformations you've seen when you've taken on clients and really helped them change their wardrobes to be more in alignment with what they wanted out of life. Well, what's fun is that most of the guys who come in and start working with me, they're expecting a transformation that obviously is visual because you don't come to work with somebody like me expecting a non-visual transformation. I would say a majority of them come in with an expectation of things being different as far as how other people perceive them, whether that may be a boss or their own clients and employees. It may be the way that a spouse or dating prospects or friends or other people see them. But the biggest transformation that always happens is my guys get a whole new perspective on themselves and they see themselves as somebody who is more capable, more competent, more self-assured, more put together, and more in control of their lives than they felt before they actually started working with me. Why is it that we didn't have these skills beforehand? Why does it take a coach in adulthood to connect these dots? I think there's a couple different things that go with this. Some of them are a little bit more just kind of following the inertia of the culture and then also how things change because it used to be that we had a largely homogenous culture, especially here in the West in the United States. And if you wanted to look respectable, there was a way to do that. You would put on a suit and a tie and you just knew that that was what the rules were. But as we've moved into a bigger culture and also as that is bifurcated more into these smaller and more localized cultures, the suit and tie is no longer a one size fits all approach. And so you have to start learning other ways to be able to communicate things like credibility, trustworthiness, authority, self-respect that used to just be default through more formal clothing and now isn't. And so it's a skill that we've recently had to learn that wasn't really there when we grew up. So I think there's that aspect of it. There's also, especially for a lot of men, there's a resistance to the idea that this stuff even matters, that the only real appropriate masculine relationship to have with your appearance is antipathy for any sort of concern for appearance, that it doesn't matter how I look as long as my clothing does the job. And when you look at history, you look at the warrior classes of any civilization ever, you look at the leadership classes or the priest castes or basically any other major civilization at any point in history anywhere Men have always cared about how they've looked and they've always used their appearance as a way to signal things like status or standing or courage or strength or mastery or honor or any of these other masculine virtues. And we've largely been told that that doesn't matter, but it's been a lie that we've been told. I have a story you'll love. Yes. I did sword fighting for a decade, metal armor, wooden weapons, full contact. So sort of like MMA, but without the jujitsu, but plus wooden weapons and just full contact. And my sword fighting teacher went on to work on what is the equivalent of the Olympics team in the sword fighting. And they go all around the world fighting. And he is now known as the American across the entire world because while most people who are fighting of that era, they have these, like you might imagine seeing in the movies, the grilled face helmets where there's just this grill and it prevents swords or whatever from getting in your face. But this guy, Avalok, went and found a historical artifact of this incredible Arabic or Persian face helmet where it was actually a depiction of a face all the way down to the beard. Oh, cool. Furthermore, he took the seven knightly virtues and had them written etched in Arabic on the helmet. So there's only one person like him in the world, 
And everywhere he goes with Team USA, everyone knows him as the American because he cares so much about his style. You can just see it. Yep. And when you see him on the battlefield, you think, "Uh oh, this guy is serious. You know he's there for a reason. Right. He's earned a reputation that is now something that's projected onto you when you come up against him. And that's the way that it worked with armor and battle and swords and all of this other stuff for millennia is the Spartans would wear red because then you wouldn't see their blood and they looked more immortal when you were fighting against them. Or it wasn't any more practical from a standpoint as far as protection to have pecs and abs chiseled into your body armor. But it looked that way. The armorers and the blacksmiths would do it that way to make you a more intimidating and imposing figure, not only for the psychological effect it would have on your enemy, but the psychological effect it would have on you and on your comrades that you were in battle with. I had this feeling when I would get an armor where I'd put on my chest plate, which had these titanium shoulders, which is pretty rare for our group. And I put on my really expensive titanium gauntlets, which I'd fought with for so many years across all these battles in the country. And it's just this transformation. And it's easy to understand that when you think about, oh, sword fighting armor, or you think about, oh, a guy getting into his welding gear to go do underwater welding. Right. But part of your message is that this is not just occupational, that that's not the point. Your point is that what you call our comfort-based fashion is actually getting in the way of us as men from developing ourselves. So tell us a bit about comfort-based fashion and why that's what you're on a crusade to get rid of. Well, it's funny because it's one of these weird outlier arenas in which the most masculine man is the one who is the most comfortable. And it doesn't work like that with any other realm of masculinity. Like you go to the gym and the guy who is the most enviable in the gym is the one who is the most comfortable. Of course not. It's the dude who is the biggest or the strongest or the fastest or the most shredded. The guy that you want to aspire to be like at work is not the one who's the most comfortable. It's the one who has the best connections or makes the most money or any of these other variables. But for some reason, when it comes to a man's relationship with appearance, we convince ourselves that aspiration is irrelevant, that hitting a high level of standards and quality and all of that is irrelevant, that all that matters is that I'm comfortable and it's a total outlier and it has no business being your main outlook on what your appearance should be because just what you hit on as far as you put on your armor and you're transformed into a different mindset, you do that to yourself with your clothing. Most of you guys are entrepreneurs. I assume most of you guys are white collar entrepreneurs. You can experience that exact same thing by having a certain type of clothing that you put on at work and then changing out of that when you go to do something else. And we recognize this when it comes to other things as far as you go into a specific room or you go into an office as opposed to just working on the laptop from your bed all day because you don't get your best work done if you're in the same place that you're eating or that you're sleeping or you're engaging in other things. You have to cross the threshold. And as you do that, your mindset changes and you can go into work mode. And it's the same thing with what you put on your body. By changing what you wear it helps you get more immersed in the activity in which you're participating. I'm reminded of the thing you read in all the habit books, which is if you want to get in the habit of going for a run, give yourself permission to put on your running shoes and walk out the front door and close the door behind you. Yeah. When I'm in work mode, like right now, I'm wearing a Redbeard t-shirt. So it's my branded company shirt. It's made in America. It's not grown in America. It's really hard to find grown in America, made in America printed t-shirts. Right. But I'm wearing grown in America, made in America jeans from Origin, Maine our Jocko's company. Yeah. And I have my shirt and this is what I always wear because I'm here to do business. I'm grown in America, made in America. When I go out to work in my garden or go work on the bees, I have these overalls I put on and I have my work boots, you know, and I'm doing a job here. But when I'm coming into my office, I have the stuff I always wear. And it's every much as part of even my lighting system is it's creating a certain experience yes. where if I'm doing a video call, I have good lighting and people comment on it and it makes me look a certain way. Like, oh, here's this guy. He's groomed and you're like, I have a beard, but it's not a crazy beard. I've had a crazy beard. When I was a sword fighter, oh man, my beard was crazy. Oh, I bet. And it was a different kind of thing. It was, I take my helmet off and people see this guy with this maybe braided beard that's insane, this crazy warrior dude, which is wonderful. But the last time I had a crazy beard was before I started my business in 2012. Because when I started that, I thought, okay, well, I need to go change who I am to go match who I want to be. Yes. And so I got clean cut, got seriously clean cut, and now I show up to work in my red beard shirt, in my American made, American grown pants, and we're, we're getting to it. So tell us, Tanner, what can guys who maybe feel a bit uncomfortable at hearing that 
comfort focused fashion and they go, oh, that may be sort of me. What concrete steps can they take to leave that comfort based above all attitude behind and move towards a style that supports who they want to be? So the first thing that I'll tell you is if you're listening to this and you're feeling some of that reticence, don't think that what you have to do is now dress more formally. That if you're in jeans and a t-shirt that all of a sudden you have to wear chinos and a button up shirt or you have to go all the way up to a suit. You can do the exact same level of formality. And Brian, you've got a great example of it's a t-shirt and it's a pair of jeans, but because of what they represent, where they're made, what the association is with them, then you're able to switch into work mode when you put them on. And so that's the first thing that I would tell you guys is just come up with something and it may be the exact same level of wardrobe that you have currently, but you improve the fit, you simplify the way that it looks and you turn it into, I really only wear this when I want to focus on this particular activity. And really you create a placebo for yourself and watch the effect start to kick in over the next few weeks or the next few months where you find that it's easier to be focused on work when you're wearing your work uniform, or it's easier to be focused on exercise when you're wearing your gym clothes. You already know that anyway, but watch it transform in these other arenas. So start with that and see what happens. And then from there, then you can start to explore into the real full skill set and level of communication that this actually becomes, where you can really understand who you are as a person, what you want to communicate, who the people are that you interact with, and what are the things that need to be communicated to them, and how all of this happens through different types of clothing that are worn in different types of ways, because there's a whole skill set around this. And once you get a taste of the power of it, it's really fun to pick up and go from there. How do you help people go from, oh, crap, I have a problem to feeling good about having different outfits or different parts of their lives and having a good sense of the appropriate amount of caring how they look. The best way to do it, and this is what I do with my coaching guys, this is the process that I outline in my book, is to help them understand that you guys probably have this backwards, where you think that fashion or style or appearance or any of these other terms, that it is something that is largely dictated by somebody else and then imposed upon you. And it may be as simple as, oh, this is the dress code at work and I have to wear this, or these are what the latest fashion designers are saying is on trend and then I have to wear this. All of that is irrelevant. What you really need to do is come to an understanding of who you are as a person and then being able to create a sense of style that if somebody gets their very first snapshot of an impression of you, they're largely able to determine that, oh, this is actually who Brian is. And then when I find out that this is who he is, it makes sense as opposed to creating a false first impression that you then have to invest all of this time and energy and effort into counter signaling as opposed to being congruent from who you are on the inside along with who you are on the outside. I was watching your video at masculine-style.com And you're talking in that video about if someone sees you across the street, what do they believe? And I thought, man, maybe we should call this podcast about how comfort-based fashion is killing your sales. Seriously. And it's not just other people. Here's the thing. Yesterday, I was working in the garden, a complete mess from just working out there, completely covered in dirt. When I came in the house later, I noticed I'd actually rubbed my forehead, so I had dirt all over my face. But before I got done working out in the garden, I told my woman, hey, I'm going to go take you out later. I'm going to be dressed nice. And she went, oh, okay. So I finished up my dirty work got out of those clothes. And then I went and got my black wingtips and I went and polished them as part of my getting ready. And yes, that tells her something, right? Oh, he's polishing his shoes. Whoa. But more importantly, right? It tells me something. I I went and spent a few minutes cleaning and polishing these nice shoes and then I put them on. And so it's not just in terms of comfort based fashion, killing your sales. It's not just they see you and they go, "Uh -uh, I don't know, or you have to counter signal as you're saying. It's also what you tell yourself. Yes. And of all the people I talk to on Zoom, how many of them care enough to have shirts that are their company shirts that are on their color tones? Almost none. And how many of those people cared enough to have them be made in America and go through that? Zero. Right. And how many of those people are wearing grown in America, made in America jeans? Yep. Zero. Yep. So when I say grown in America, made in America, the podcast team editing this podcast are friends of mine. They're all in America. Like, I'm serious. And so when I say, yeah, work with me, I'm based in America, like, let's do this, that I'm telling myself a story, even as much as I'm telling a prospect a story. Well, and it's an integrity thing because you have now gone out of your way to be able to be so congruent in who you are, what your values are and what you believe in that you don't just say, well, my values stop here or my integrity stops here. It goes to this point and no further, but you're willing to reinforce that to yourself. And so by not compromising on the small things, 
you have so much more integral momentum so that you're willing and able to maintain your integrity on the big things and the things where it really matters. I love that connection. I'm reminded of, was it an admiral who said, if you want to really control your day, make your bed because it's the simple thing you can do. You have almost complete control over it yep. and it prepares you. It creates this, this snowball for greater things later. Absolutely. Yep. And I love what you're saying about the integrity of clothing. Yeah. And most people don't think about it that way, but it really is. It's always either working for you or against you. You're going to be wearing clothing for the rest of your life. So you may as well have it work for you from your own identity perspective, from the way that you communicate with other people, from it aligning with your morals and your integrity, have all of it work for you as opposed to against you. I went into a Goodwill the other day, a thrift shop to go get some towels for the dog. Cause I thought we just need more towels to clear out the dog when she comes in, cause she's muddy. And it used to be that I would shop in thrift stores because it was cheap. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of clothing was to cover you and to protect you from the elements, whether you're doing electrical work or out mountain climbing, the purpose is to protect you from the elements. And if you would sum up my style in my 20s, that was my style. Right. Sword fighting, mountain climbing, I'm being protected from the elements. That's it. And I walked into Goodwill to get these towels. And my goodness, Tanner, the energy in there. And I thought, whoa, whoa, what's this energy? That it's so foreign to me because now, I do business with, when possible, grown in America, made in America, or at least made in America. A lot of my shirts come from Duckworth, which is grown and made in Montana, or jeans made in Maine, grown in the South somewhere. Mm -hmm. And to take this walk back down memory lane, it was intensely uncomfortable because I was no longer the person who would walk in there in terms of how I choose to look like, yeah, for cleaning a dog, it's fantastic. And certainly thrift shops were wonderful for me in my 20s. It was great. Right. But who I want to be now and who I want to be a year from now, 10 years from now, that's where I get rags from now. Right. And it's this perspective difference. And you, you said integrity before. I love that. It's this integrity of for who I want to be, for the people I want to serve, for how much I want to serve them. I'm not going to do that in $5 jeans from Goodwill. No. I'm going to go buy origin jeans. I have a story. I have a relationship. You know, In my head, I have a story with the creators. I've watched videos of that factory. I know their story. And so it's this alignment thing. Yep. 100%. And that's not to say that there are not ways that it aligns with other people's integrity or with their aspirations to be the one who does shop at Goodwill, because there are times when that really is what's going to work best for you. And you need to be able to affect that and make that happen. And that's, I think that's one of the big problems that a lot of guys experience when it comes to style is they think that there's a one size fits all approach. And there's not, there's not a certain article of clothing that every man needs to own. There's not a certain way that you have to tie this or wear that, or it's a language. And just like there's not a certain number of words that you have to be able to know, or your vocabulary or accent or your idioms all have to fit within this particular thing. There are general rules that you need to follow. And then there's a whole lot of room for personal expression and being able to, to communicate in the way that's best for you and the audience that you surround yourself with. Tanner, what do guys who are listening to this and they're on board, what are the specific next actions they can take to start a conversation with you about developing their own personal sense of style? Best thing to do is start spending some time going through a lot of my free content. So you can find a lot of that articles and things at masculine style. Give me a follow on Twitter or on Instagram where I post a lot about this and other things related to masculinity or stuff that is kind of ancillary to this. I'm an entrepreneur myself. And so I know a lot of what you guys are going through, but start going through some of that free content. If you want to invest a little bit more, I've written a book on this. It's called The Appearance of Power. And you can pick that up on Amazon or on Audible and really just start to get comfortable and get familiar with the whole idea that there's a philosophy to this and there is a big picture approach. Think more that big picture strategy as opposed to just the tactic of, oh, what shoes should I be buying or, oh, what kind of shirt should I be wearing right now? I would relate what you wear to being as roughly a similar level of importance to what you eat. Well, if I had to choose between one or the other, I'd choose what I eat to focus on. Yeah. That the basic thing of the energy you're putting in and around your body and the stories you're telling yourself. If you eat at McDonald's, you're telling yourself a story. If you drink Coke, you're telling yourself a story. If you dress for comfort, because you can, because you're on a Zoom call uh, and you're, you're wearing your board shorts, you're telling yourself a story. Absolutely. And so the clothing, it behooves all of us just as much as I harp on really eating grass-fed meat and really paying a lot of attention to where your food comes from and the food that goes into your family's bodies, that how you dress is telling yourself a story and it's this continuing dialogue that's going to last until you're dead. Yep. It's forever. It doesn't stop. You can't get there, right? You're not just done. No, but just like with eating, it gets easier and more intuitive as you get better and better at it. Just like 
being in shape and maintaining a decent shape is a whole lot easier than trying to get in good shape. The same thing happens with your appearance. As soon as you learn what these skills are and you get the momentum working for you, it becomes something that the dividends don't diminish, but the effort that you have to put into it diminishes. And so you're then freed up to put that energy and effort into stacking the next talent or developing the next skill set that can be synergistic with all of these other things that you're already working on. And the farther you walk down the path, the more you can feel when you're out of alignment. Like if I was in a McDonald's line, I would feel out of alignment. When I dressed up yesterday, I noticed these aren't the right socks. Right. This is the right shirt, but the socks weren't right. Well, where would these socks come from? I don't know. Fred Meyer a couple years ago. I don't know. There's no story in those socks. Right. Where are they made? I don't know. That's not who I am. So I felt incongruent. They're just socks. Exactly. They're, that's your second book or your third book. They're just socks. <laughs> and that's not how I dress. Right. I don't know. Was I empowering or hurting the people who made those socks? I don't know. And that's not an integrity with who I am. So I, right. I could feel the rub, the discomfort. Like, ah, oh, I haven't looked at this part. But, you know, the jeans, the shirt, like everything else, I know what I'm doing. So I could notice that. Yep. Well, Tanner, thank you so much for being on the show. Folks, it's masculine-style.com. Tanner Guzzi on Twitter. That's T-A-N-N-E-R-G-U-Z-Y on Twitter. Tanner, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me on, Brian.